Hello there. Welcome to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium. And in this episode, we're rounding out the month of October, running through the dates of October 25th through October 31st. We're going to start by talking about the highest position of Mercury in the morning and the highest position of Venus in the evening, two inner solar system planets. They'll be highest above the horizon for those times of the morning and the evening. Then we're gonna talk about Venus again and the interesting phase you could see if you looked at it through a telescope on the right date. And we're gonna end with a preview of what the night sky looks like on Halloween and talk about some spooky celestial objects that you can find. So let's get to it. At the very beginning of this week, the planet Mercury reaches its highest position in our morning sky towards the east just before sunrise. Now, by the time this episode airs, this event had already happened in the early morning of Monday, but I still want to mention this because Mercury will still be pretty high even a couple days after this. So we have the time set to actually Monday morning. Again, this would have already happened. And if you're looking just before the light from the sun fills the sky, you look just above the eastern horizon if you have a clear view of that area, and you may see Mercury right here, the solar system's smallest planet, and of course the planet closest to the sun. And this event, technically speaking, is called Greatest Elongation West. So that means that Mercury is most west of the sun in the sky, which also means that it's highest in the morning. So that's always nice if you're out in the morning, maybe taking a walk, doing something early on, you might see this non-twinkling object just above the horizon, and that may be the planet Mercury, which moves really, really quickly, so you don't always get a good chance of seeing it. Now, again, if you miss this on Monday morning, you wait Tuesday morning, and Mercury won't technically be as high as it is on Monday, but if we move on to Tuesday morning, the 26th, you'll see it's just a little bit lower, so it didn't change too, too much. And as you go through the rest of the week, it will start descending very quickly towards the sun as we move ahead. But again, going back to the beginning of the week, we'll find little Mercury right there above the horizon there. And if you have a chance to see it, it is a wonderful planet to be able to spot in the sky with your naked eyes. If we move a little further into the week, on Friday the 29th, we have another planet reaching its highest position above the horizon, but this time in the evening, and that's the brightest planet in our sky, the planet Venus. And we've talked a lot about Venus over many episodes here this fall and past summertime. It's been a wonderful object to look at in the evening after sunset, it really, really shines. And so Venus takes its turn at greatest elongation, but this time greatest elongation east. So it's most east of the sun, which means it's highest in our evening sky. And it's just really, really hard to miss Venus. If you're looking anywhere near this part of the west and southwest really, where you're gonna find this really bright object here. And I love looking for it right now. It's been a great time for this planet. And so it reaches its highest point and eventually over time will start to loop back around towards the sun. Again, unlike Mercury, it doesn't move as fast, so you have a little more time to see it in a given area, but it still moves at a decent pace throughout the weeks and month or so. So definitely take a look at it and take advantage of Venus being this high above the sky. So hopefully you get a chance to celebrate Venus being at its highest position. Again, greatest elongation east. If we move back just one evening from Venus being at greatest elongation east on Thursday the 28th, we have something really interesting going on with this planet. Of course, it's really bright as seen with your naked eyes, but if you have a chance to see it through a telescope, you get a much closer view of it, then you'll notice something interesting with the appearance of the planet as seen from Earth, and that is, it is in a half phase here, sort of, sort of like a letter D in the sky, and that's kind of neat to see that Venus goes through phases just like our own moon. And since Venus is inside the orbit of Earth, it's what's called an inferior planet. That's not putting down Venus, even though I think Earth, of course, is a probably a little bit better planet since it's our home. But anyway, since it's an inferior planet, a planet inside the orbit of Earth, it can go through phases. So the sun can hit Venus at different angles and it creates different appearances depending on where the sun is hitting the beautifully bright and reflective clouds, those carbon dioxide clouds of 
Venus. As we know, those clouds trap the heat, makes Venus super, super hot. It is the hottest planet in the solar system. There is another name for this, and sometimes this is called Venus at dichotomy. So that's when you see it about half full, and it happens again on Thursday the 28th, when you really see that nice phase between the night side and the day side of the planet. And of course, since it can go through phases, you can see different amounts of the atmosphere lit. And what we can do here is move the time backwards and forwards. We can watch how the phases have been changing with Venus. I'm actually going to move the time a little bit later in the evening here, just to give us a better position of the planet. And let's just move back in time some dates here. It's gonna move pretty quickly. And we'll just move all the way back to August. And you can see Venus being a larger phase. This is when it was a gibbous phase. But what's been happening since then, it's been waning. So you're seeing less of the lit part of the clouds. So let's move ahead in time really quickly through August and September into October. Notice how we're seeing less of the planet lit. As we continue, you're gonna see eventually go to a crescent phase as we get into December later this year. And that's when Venus will be much, much lower in the sky. But there is a chance to see a crescent phase of the planet there. So it's kind of neat to see these phases change. You need a telescope to see it, and preferably if you have some type of filter as well that can kind of lessen the brightness of Venus. Uh, Venus is just really, really, really bright, and so it can be hard to see through the glare of those reflective clouds, the nice phase, but you can, and it's really, really great. So anyway, going back to the date that we're working with here back on the 28th year, that's when we have a really nice half-lit Venus, Venus at dichotomy, and it's always cool to know that it can go through phases just like our own moon. This year in 2021, Halloween happens to fall on Sunday. And for those who may be trick-or-treating or just doing something on Sunday night, and even Saturday night too, the 30th, sometimes things happen on the night before Halloween, but at least specifically for the 31st Sunday night, I wanted to show you what the night sky looks like generally. Maybe you're outside and it's clear in your local neighborhood and you have a chance to see a few things in night sky. It's always a fun thing to do and to maybe point things out to other folks that you might run into or your family and friends. So speaking of Sunday night, you can generally see a lot of great things. Of course, the planets are still really great too. We talked about Venus already a whole bunch. Venus, you can see at a nice convenient hour. This is about eight o'clock local time. So you can still see Venus by then, the bright beacon of light from the solar system's brightest planet as seen from Earth. What's also been great too in the south here around this time, we have Jupiter and Saturn as well, which are really great. If you have binoculars or a telescope, definitely take a look at those objects there. And of course, some really wonderful stars, some late summer and of course, fall stars and constellations. We look really high up at this time, almost straight up, but slightly to the west now at about eight o'clock, we find that summer triangle, these three stars here making up this giant asterism, the summer triangle that can be seen for both the summer and for the fall and even to the beginning of winter time as well, so that's kind of nice. Each of those stars, as you may know, are part of a different constellation. Altair here is part of Aquila the Eagle, and then we have this star, the brightest star in the triangle, farthest west of it, and that is Vega as part of the tiny constellation of Lyra the Harp. And then we have the last star we'll mention here, highest or at least farthest to the north, called Deneb, which is part of Cygnus the Swan. And what's nice is that you have a bit darker of a sky if it's clear in your area, because the moon won't be out, and you might have a chance to see the Milky Way still, and Cygnus the Swan flying through the Milky Way, which is always a treat if you have a chance to see that. I can turn on those constellations. Now as we move over to the east here, there we'll find those fall constellations. And also where we can talk about some interesting objects that also relate to Halloween. And the constellation I wanna mention is in the southeast. It is not one of the brightest ones, but it is famous for the fall and is part of some famous stories as well. And that's a constellation called Cetus the Sea Monster. I'll click on this star here called Difda, which is the brightest star in Cetus. The rest of the stars aren't as bright, but it is there. And this is a sea monster, so that's kind of appropriate for Halloween, right? We think of spooky, scary things. A sea monster, sometimes known as the whale, maybe not as scary, but this is also known as the sea monster, the one who attacked Andromeda, Princess Andromeda, 
but was slayed by the mighty warrior named Perseus, who defeated Cetus the sea monster. So Cetus is there, having connection to Halloween, at least for the type of creature it is. But what I love about this constellation in particular, there is an interesting celestial object inside of it that really relates to Halloween. So what we're gonna do here is let's find it by using a search function here. And there is something called, no joke, the Skull Nebula, and it sits near the tail of Cetus the sea monster, not too far from the brightest star that I pointed out here, Difta. We're gonna zoom into it. And again, called the Skull Nebula, when we zoom in, it kinda looks like a spooky skull. These take some imagination. Of course, this is our own ideas kind of being placed onto celestial objects but it's kind of fun to make up these kind of things and relate them to Halloween. So here it is, and what it's supposed to look like is a skull, maybe some eyes here, if that kind of roughly looks like that, or the sockets for the eyes, I guess you would say, and maybe the mouth of a very skull kind of ominous looking sort of feature in the sky. What this is, is pretty interesting. This is called a planetary nebula. So inside of this is a white dwarf star. That is the dead core of the star, the very dense core left behind by a much larger star that was dying, a star similar possibly to our sun, that did not explode, but as it ate through its gases in its atmosphere, it started to expand and expand, and its outer layers kept expanding until eventually gravity could not hold on to those layers anymore, and it just kept bubbling out into what is called a planetary nebula because early astronomers thought these looked like planets through telescopes. They turn out to be the death throes of stars similar to our sun shedding their gas into space and they can create some really interesting patterns and shapes that are fun to sort of place your imagination on. So here we have that planetary nebula. This is fairly far away at a rough distance of about 1600 light years away. So it's not right next door to us, but it is close enough to be seen through a telescope. And then again, it might look like a skull with some eyes and a mouth here, sitting inside the sea monster of Cetus that we mentioned right there. So that works really well. Now, another object we can find for this time of year here in the fall is something a little bit more to the north, really northeast. So we're gonna move away from here. And this also relates to Cetus the sea monster. And what we're gonna find is another nebula. This time one is connected to a different type of spooky creature for Halloween. So what we're gonna find here is something called the Ghost Nebula. And so we'll type that in here. The Ghost Nebula sits inside a constellation called Cepheus, who was the king. Actually, he was the father of Andromeda, the one that this sea monster was attacking. Actually, Cepheus wasn't really a nice person. He actually sacrificed his daughter to the sea monster because his wife Cassiopeia was so vain and thought she was so pretty that the gods did not like that and wanted to punish them. So they decided to punish their daughter instead. But anyway, inside of this king, he was the king of Ethiopia, and here he is, at least the picture in the sky to the north, you're gonna find possibly, if you had a telescope, a really, really cool nebula here. And as we zoom in, again, called the Ghost Nebula. This is really appropriate because it almost looks like the veil of ghosts and if you look to the left here, don't these look like apparitions, ghosts kind of reaching out almost with their arms kind of sticking out? I love that effect here. And this is called reflection nebula. So you have some stars kind of in the area that are reflecting their light on and through this veil of dust and gas. It's an amazing feature here. And to see those kind of ghostly sort of figures inside of it reaching out really works well for Halloween, so that's a beautiful, beautiful image. This is of course from a really decent sized telescope and some decent astrophotography here, but it really reveals some beautiful areas around stars and you get this beautiful nebulosity that we find there inside of Cepheus. Now let's move to another character that relates to this area and to Cepheus and that is his wife, the queen, called Cassiopeia inside of here. And there's something kind of well known in Cassiopeia, something called the Ghost of Cassiopeia, sometimes also called the Ghost Nebula as well, it just depends on who you ask. But in Stellarium, we'll have to look up something called IC63. And so we'll zoom into this portion of Cassiopeia the Queen. I'll turn on her picture just so you can see her. She's this woman sitting on a throne here and she thought she was really beautiful. That's why she's holding a mirror here. 
very vain character from Greek mythology. But as we zoom in to the right to the middle, because Cassiopeia almost looks like a W shape. So the middle of the W is this star here called Gamma Cassiopeiae. And I'm gonna zoom into that area and right underneath is the ghost of Cassiopeia. Kind of ghost-like in its feature here, really kind of neat area. And uh, again, almost looks like the veil of a ghost. And what's happening here, this is a nebula, a cloud of gas and dust that's being affected by this star here. This star is shining very brightly in ultraviolet light and is interacting with the clouds of gas here. A lot of this is hydrogen here. And you see the reddish color, it's called hydrogen alpha from the hydrogen atoms that are interacting with the ultraviolet light from that star. They're ionized and they're recombining with electrons which makes them have this reddish glow that we find there. And so the sort of kind of ghostly-like apparition, almost looks like a ghost here as well, is being created or affected by the star Gamma Cassiopeiae inside the heart of this queen in the fall sky. Look for the W inside the middle of it, we have the ghost of Cassiopeia. So really neat area as well that you could possibly see at least the area in the sky if you're out and about during Halloween. Now there's one more I wanna show you that I really love and we gotta stay up really, really late. So if you're out really late or I guess you could say even early in the morning, I'm not sure if anyone will be, but let's just say you're out just a bit later. We have Orion the Hunter rising. Now Orion of course is a winter constellation as we've spoken about before. You have his belt here, you have his legs and feet here, his shoulders there. So you may know Orion already, most people do. I'll turn on him, he was that mighty hunter from Greek mythology. But there is a really great nebula that I have to mention for Halloween at the foot of Orion, his left foot. This is a star, a very bright star in Orion called Rigel, usually labeled the brightest star in Orion. This is a hot blue star, very, very large. But if we zoom into it, we got something interesting in that area. So let's zoom in and we might be able to find a really cool nebula here and hopefully we can kind of see it right in this direction here, a little bit above it. Right here is a reflection nebula called the Witch's Head Nebula. And I don't know if you can see the Witch's Head, but you have kind of the tip of the chin, the kind of really pointy chin right here. And we have a nose and then we kind of have eyes right here. And so of course we think witches and Halloween definitely go hand in hand. It almost looks like the head of a witch that we find right there, really cool effect. And this nebula is lit blue because of the light from this star Rigel. That star is reflecting its light onto it. And a lot of times when you get reflection of light with a nebula, blue is a color you see quite often due to the type of scattering of light you get. And so you get that kind of signature bluish color, which really kind of adds to the witch-like effect that we see here. So you kind of have to turn your head here, but you might be able to see kind of the witch's head, again, nose, the chin right there, the eyes, or you can imagine any other way too, you know? You don't have to think of these exact way that we're talking about here, but you can see why these names are assigned to these types of objects. So that's something you'd have to see. If you had a telescope, you had the right equipment, really late or real early in the morning. So probably past when people are actually trick-or-treating, but still, I think it's nice to kind of relate that to Halloween as well. So there you have it, a bit of our Halloween sky, some of the constellations, some of the planets that we can find on that evening. Maybe we're out and about doing various things, but it's always fun to celebrate not only Halloween, but astronomy as well. Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in and supporting us. And we hope to see you around at the museum as well if you're in Daytona Beach. And definitely check out our Loman Planetarium. We are running shows daily, all different programs that may interest you. If you want any more information about those programs, check online for our schedule. So with that, I'd like to say happy Halloween and definitely happy stargazing. <laughs>